opportunities. Thanks, Ty. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's all. <laughs> that's all. I need. All right, Ty, you're the number one player on KSL Sports Top 100 BYU Football Players of All Time list. Your reaction to that? Well, I'm <laughs> flattered, but you know it's always hard to pick the best. You know, there's different positions, different era, different. Uh, different opponents, all those things, but um, I appreciate the vote of confidence, but um, you know, there are a lot of great players that have come through BYU and just fortunate to be a part of one of them. There really has been a lot of uh, amazing players, especially at the quarterback position, and it's well documented, the quarterback factory here, and, and you know, when you arrived at BYU, was, like, how much did you know about the, the history of the factory when you were going through the recruiting process? Well, that was a reason for being interested in BYU for sure. You know, to hear of, you know, Gifford Nielsen, Mark Wilson, Jim McMahon, Steve Young, Robbie Bosco just won a national championship. Um, you know, and then you get on campus and the old football office for Shirley was and, and all the coaches <laughs> went down, you know, stairs there in the Smith Fieldhouse, but they had the Davy O'Brien medals and the trophies and some of those things up on the wall. And, you know, you come in as a freshman and it's like, man, it would be cool if I could have one up there too. And so um, just the tradition kind of, you know, made you want to be one of those guys and, and have that opportunity, you know. So um, it, it was a special place for quarterbacks then for sure. What was your first memory of BYU football even when you were growing up and did you have any knowledge of BYU before your recruiting process? <laughs> Not much. I, I knew of the whole debate whether they were national championship mm. uh, or national champions or not. Um, you know, being in Texas, it's, it was all, you know, big 12 then or whatever Southwest, Southwest conference. conference. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, you, but I saw a team that threw the ball. And uh, I think I remember watching a little bit of that Michigan game, the Holiday Bowl, and, and just seeing them spread out and, and doing what we were doing in high school. Um, you know, the backs were involved in the routes and things like that. So I, I didn't know anything else about BYU, didn't even know where Provo was. Um, but I knew that there was a school out there throwing the ball and producing great quarterbacks. You were at BYU from, from 1987 to 1991. I, I, I sometimes forget that you did have that redshirt year yep. uh, because I think with, with quarterbacks nowadays, you just think <laughs> they got to get on the field or else they're going to go into the portal. Right. I'm curious when uh, that first year when you were redshirting, was there ever any homesickness or thinking, man, this isn't what I thought it was and <laughs> I want to maybe look out elsewhere? Was, was that, what was that first year like when you were redshirting? Uh, I never had those thoughts ever. Um, you know, matter of fact, I think we were playing at TCU or mm. Night of the Crickets, you know, there were, <laughs> and I was a red shirt, but we were struggling offensively. Uh, I think Sean Covey came in and replaced Bob Jensen, and, and we were still just struggling. And it, it was probably later in the year. I don't think it was early in the year, but I kind of was like looking at the coaches like, am I going to get my shot, you know? And, you know, fortunately, they, they held off. I would, probably wouldn't have been any better that first year. Um, they held off and allowed me to kind of mature a little bit more and and then uh, ease into it my freshman year, the, the next year. You got the, your first start, I believe it was New Mexico in 1988. What do you remember about that moment or just getting told that you were going to be the starter? What was, can you describe what, what that moment was? Yes, um, fortunately I'd played some before that. Uh, you know, didn't have the greatest experience at Wyoming that first game, but, you know, had other parts, you know, um, parts of games and, and had some success and kind of grew from that Wyoming game. But uh, it was a different beast being a starter. You know, I know the nerves were there. I don't think we did great the first series or two, just kind of, you know, getting your feet wet a little bit. And then all of a sudden we took off and, and uh, you know, put it, put it on them pretty good and, and uh, threw a few TDs and things <laughs> like that. But um, I remember having some pregame nerves, knowing that you were going to be the guy. And it's, it's a little different than coming in at halftime with nothing to lose. How did you prepare as a, like a, a starting quarterback? Like what was a, a work week like for – for Ty Detmer, the starting quarterback, where you, it was a heavy emphasis on just breaking out as much film as you possibly could. Like, what was that work week like? Yeah, um, you know, getting to know their defense, but more importantly, getting more reps and practice helps. Um, you know, as a backup, you don't get too many, uh, a few here and there, but 
um, having all the reps that week and, and just being able to run the offense um, throughout the whole week really helped uh, kind of prepare you more so than, you know, just, you know, diving in on the film. But, you know, the defense is, it is what it is. You got to read it no matter what they throw at you and, uh, and be prepared. So um, I just I felt comfortable after having a, a full week of reps. How, uh, what was the, uh, the moment that you became the, the full-time quarter or full-time starting quarterback in 1989? We, we know that, but like the moment that Lavelle or, or the staff, uh, Norm Chow told you that you are the guy, now you are the face of this part. What was that like? Yeah. Uh, it was pretty cool. So, um, you know, we played Colorado in the Freedom Bowl, um, at the end of that season. And I came in at half, we ended up winning the game. Uh, I think that really kind of solidified things in the coach's mind, like, Hey, we're probably going to make a change next year. And but then Sean Covey went through knee surgery in the spring. So he missed all the spring ball. So that kind of allowed me to, to get in there and become, you know, a leader with the guys in the huddle and, and get a ton of reps there for spring. And, and then we did, you know, compete. We still, you know, you had to compete in fall camp. And and then I remember Lavelle pulling me in and saying, hey, you're the guy. And, uh, you know, we're, it's your team. And, and, you know, I come out and Sean's there and he's like, hey, you know, it's his senior year. It's tough, you know, losing that to a sophomore. But he, you know, true to form, Sean being Sean was like, I'm here to help you. And whatever you need, just let me know. If, if you want me looking at safeties or helping you read coverage when you come off, let me know what I can do to help. Yeah. And that meant a lot knowing that, you know, there wasn't contention and it was, he had my back and, and that, you know, it was, it was my job and, and here we go. And so, um, just the whole thing, you know, the way everybody handled it from coaches to, to Sean and the other quarterbacks was awesome. In, when you bring up Lavelle, just saying you're the guy, I, I, that just seems like so Lavelle, like so just simple, but like <laughs> man, like he, when he speaks, it was just so profound. <laughs> yeah, that was Lavelle. He didn't, he didn't, you know, sit there. It wasn't a long speech. It was, you know, hey, you know, be a leader, become, you know, keep doing what you've been doing, and and uh, we're, you know, we'll grow with you, that kind of thing. But that was. It was, and I, you know, I'm in Lavelle's office. I'm yeah. not going to say a lot. I'm, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Looking forward to it. And that was it. So what do you remember about Lavelle's office? Like, what, um, what was it like? Because it was, a, it was in the Smith field house or cross street. There wasn't the student athlete building back right. then. It was in that field. House. Yeah, it was right there. You know, the first office you come to down the steps. And, and I mean, he had all kinds of awards and not, not his own personal award, but sure. a lot of memorabilia and things in there. And, the big desk, the big comfy <laughs> chair, and it was like, he's the head guy. Um, so, you know, you, you had a ton of respect for him and, and um, just, you know, all that he'd done for the program. And, um, and when you talk about everything he did for the program, I, I feel like people don't realize now, uh, after his time's gone by, like how big BYU football was at that time. And like, I mean, I know there was still that fight for respect, you know, being in the whack, but but BYU football was like a factory of you know, like football minds would descend on Provo and like pick apart like what Lavelle's doing because it was just so innovative and how how was how was it to be around just football minds and, and the people probably walking in and out of the halls observing, <laughs> observing that program at the time and being a part of it. Yeah. Well, people were coming in like young guys. You know, you look at How Mummy and yeah. and Leach and and those guys were young and they were just coming in like soaking it all up. You know, and but you know. Mike Holmgren had been there, and, and Gary, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Doug Scoville. Doug Scoville, you know, some great football minds early on had come in there and passed along some of that. Um, Lavelle wasn't a real X's and O's guy at that time, I'm sure when he got there. He was a defensive coach, you know, yeah. overall. So he, you know, he had the foresight to say, hey, I need to bring in some sharp offensive guys, and he did. But, but there were guys and coaches always coming through, and and, you know, you'd see them passing, you know, and they were in watching film and just seeing what mm -hmm. we were doing. And, you know, Norm Chow was, was great. He'd go off. He went to Detroit when the run and shoot was big, and he brought yeah. back some concepts. And, and we tried them in spring, and if I liked them, he kept them in. If I didn't, he threw them out. Mm -hmm. And to his credit, it wasn't like he tried to force feed you things. It was, you know, he, he, he you know, knew that the quarterback had to be comfortable with it or it wasn't going to be successful. So... He was going and bringing a few ideas in as well. So 
it was a great place to be and, and just, you know, you never knew concepts were coming and going yeah. and, and uh, people were coming and learning and our coaches were going and bringing things back too. So it was awesome. It, 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 how extensive was the, the playbook uh, by the time you were a senior in 91, just the, the depth of like what, I mean, how much did you have to work with? Um, you know, looking back, I, I tell people, I'm like, I don't remember it being real sophisticated, complicated. It wasn't like we had a ton of plays, but but then you watch some of the games, and it's like, okay, we're motioning, we're shifting, we're moving people around, yeah. um, but we were running our same stuff. You know, we just given it a different look, and so, um, you know, I don't remember there being a hundred plays in the game plan. It was, you know, thirty game, you know, thirty <laughs> plays in the game plan, and. And we executed, and that's what the coaches preached every day in practice was execution. The receivers had to be in the right place at the right time. The ball had to be coming out in the right place at the right time. You mentioned that the Heisman Trophy tie and that that image of, of you in Hawaii and having that first reaction that everyone's looking at you, it's, it's iconic. It's in BYU Laura. <laughs> it's one of the great images of, of BYU football. I'm curious, like, where, what, like, what was that a hotel, team hotel? Where was that at? And just the, the, uh, the thoughts leading up to that night, yeah. uh, that Saturday night and that, that weekend. And uh, did you really think you were going to win the, the Heisman? So I think going into it, you know, Rocket Ismail obviously getting a ton of attention at Notre Dame and they're on TV every week. And um, I, I really, I don't think I ever let myself think that it mm -hmm. would happen. Um, and then, we were in Hawaii. We flew over on Thursday. We were going to play that night on Saturday night. And uh, and Friday, the USA Today paper comes out with the weekend edition. And um, so they had one for every room. And I just remember looking at it. And they, they had kind of a straw poll a little bit. And I was on top. And it mm. was kind of the first time you, you really thought, man, this could actually happen. Um, and so it was different. It was a week earlier back then. So we, we did have a game. There were a couple other, I think David Klingler was playing somewhere. So he was off site. Um, but the cool thing about it was the coaches, the players, everybody got to be there where if you go to New York, it's your family and a coach, you generally, right. maybe a couple teammates, you know, but, um, for that, everybody got to be there and, and it was cool because I really felt like everybody was a part of it. And, and then we got out and got our butts kicked that night, but it was it was a pretty cool celebration. The guys were fired up, and and uh, it was neat to have everybody there. That that's a good point because that that nineteen ninety team was was pretty special, and and I think that I remember going to that that Hawaii game. You guys still had kind of an outside shot at maybe a national you know championship race at you know the, being in the top five or so. Uh, do you feel like it was also maybe that Heisman a, a byproduct of all the the, the players before kind of building up uh, the, the quarterback factory as we talked about earlier. Oh, for sure. You know, without, you know, Gifford and Mark and Jim and, and Steve and, and Robbie, you know, who yeah. they, they really put the program on the map. And, and I was fortunate to be able to play a number one team. Um, sometimes they didn't have that on their schedule, you know, a, a top 10 team or, or things like that. You know, they each, all of them kind of had signature wins along the way. Um, but for me, having number one, there's no disputing now level of competition and all those things to be able to, to beat Miami really set it off, you know. But, but those guys were the initial, like, okay, we need to watch this guy uh, because of those other guys. The, uh, you bring up the, the Miami game, and, and what's interesting, too, it seems like with Miami, at least from my vantage point, that that Miami team still holds up. And, and you guys, too, like, it was two teams of the 80s squaring off two programs that defined the previous decade and squaring off on that, uh, what was it, the, the video, the, the rare hurricane watch over Provo, Utah. Um, it, just it, it, the, 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 the competition that you were facing in that game against Miami and then just how good also you guys were, too, in that, that matchup. Yeah. Um, fortunately, we were able to play them a couple of years before down in the Orange Bowl, and they got after us pretty good. But I think some of us young guys got some time in the second half, and I know I learned a ton from that game uh, about their speed and just how they played. Um, so we had a little bit of, of you know experience with them, but... 
I know that team felt confident. We had a great senior group and then a good strong junior group behind. So it was a perfect combination to be able to go and play teams like that. Um, so, you know, it was, uh, it was just kind of the right place, the right time that night and, uh, everything fell into place. Defense played great. Um, you know, everybody was a piece of that one, you know, that, uh, that win, it, you kind of marvel that it's still, say, holds the test. I mean, it's always going to be revered, but, uh, still probably be the, the best win in program history. Yeah, um, just I think because of that, because they're number one. And it's not like they were number one and then ended up number 25. Yep. They, they, I think they might have even won the national championship or finished second that year. They um, won the Cotton Bowl and, and crushed Texas. Yeah, so uh, it wasn't like they weren't a good team. And, and so um, they kept winning and winning and winning and, and ended up uh, proving that that was a good quality win. How fun was that uh like that ride after that. I mean, and how, how challenging was it to avoid the distractions? I mean, in the, in the media today, it's, it's, yeah. it, it's distracting. I can only imagine how, how much it was back then too. <laughs> well, the next week wasn't very fun, especially in the first half. We, uh, <laughs> we got down pretty good to Washington state who had a pretty good football team, yeah. but, um, you know, we, we kind of talked like, Hey, that Miami win is not going to mean anything if we don't back it up the next week. And we came out a little flat, fell behind, uh, but then got it going in the second half and ended up having a great come from behind win and, and then kind of set off, you know, and then you got, uh, you know, I think San Diego State and we ended up losing to Oregon, which tough place to play. They were they were ready for us. Um, I didn't practice all week, didn't have my best game um, due to a hand injury. Um, but, you know, we we had a, just a, a fun team. It was, it was an exciting team to watch. You never knew what was going to happen, um, but uh, you knew we were going to put some points on the board and, uh, and uh, just a, a fun team, fun season to be a part of. What, what was the personalities like of uh, those, those BYU teams that you, that you were part of from 88 to 91? Like, I guess I think on the outside, people just assume BYU is just a bunch of cookie cutter LDS guys they don't do anything but like there's there's always been great personalities in the BYU football program and you of course part of that and just maybe uh, highlight some of the just the dynamics of the, the locker room in those years yeah it was it was a dynamic locker room I mean you have Brian Mitchell Tony Crutchfield yeah. uh you know Matt Bellini Michael Brian uh the year before uh you know you just you had some characters and then you know you had a few renegades that were towing the line you know they were they were making it and, and doing <laughs> doing what they could to stay in school but um overall uh you know we we meshed really well and and i don't know i mean if i had a hand in that it's kind of you know i i wasn't a partier i didn't you know stay out and hang around not into the, the crazy hawaii no. stories that we hear in the urban <laughs> legend now no but it wasn't jim mcmahon there um, and so but i think i can help bridge all of those different personalities together and and i got along with everybody yeah. you know i mean i i i got along with every group and uh from you know the polynesians to to the guys from texas that helped recruit to to the guys from LA, you know, we were and the guys from Utah, and we were we were pretty close knit group and just had a great time. It's pretty pretty cool. I appreciate you sharing that because uh, Lavelle always had a pretty good eye <laughs> of just bringing guys in, and, and that BYU brand can really kind of bring people together. It can, and and he did a great job of educating the players and and you know keeping them in line, um, you know, trying to to make sure they understood what was expected of them and and uh you know we we had some characters and, you know you go from bob davis to you know the, the whole crew you know linebackers are a little bit out there anyway but um but lavelle did a great job of managing all those personalities as well and making sure guys were were doing the right things beyond the miami game are, are there other games that that you look at personally for you in, in high regard and it, it can be any direction that, that you want to take it, but like any games that you just like look back and go, that was that was a sweet moment. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we lost to Penn State in the Holiday Bowl the year before in '89, um, but I think that gave us a ton of confidence mm -hmm. going into the next season um, because. I mean, as a kid, I'd watch Penn State, and they were built on defense. And then we went in there and threw for 500 yards and, 
and uh, kind of a couple fluke plays at the end, or otherwise we're, we win it or we tie them, you know, um, on a two-point conversion. But um, I think that gave us a ton of confidence. So even though it was a loss, I, I felt like that gave us a springboard for getting ready for Miami the next year and then some belief that we could play with anybody. Um, you know, I think in 89 beating Utah all of the way we did after they beat us the year before was kind of a little revenge game. <laughs> um, that was a, a sweet victory just because we'd had to hear it all year long, you know. Um, for, first seven drives, right? So you guys are up 49-0 before <laughs> you can even blink. And, and Lavelle was kind enough to say, let's call the dog. You guys could have probably put up 100. Yeah, I think I played one series in the second half and we scored and then it was out, you know. So, um, you know, that that one was pretty special just because just – We'd heard about it the whole time. Uh, I still still tell Scott Mitchell he owes me some more yards because had he played, I probably would have stayed in the game longer. Um, but, uh, you know, some of those being Oregon in 89, uh, they had an All-American corner, and Jeff Franson, I think, had three or four touchdowns on him specifically. And, and uh, you know, so you, you go back and you look, and, you know, some of, the, some of the games, even tying San Diego State my senior year to – to give us a chance to win the WAC against Utah the next week. Um, we didn't win the game, but, you know, we, we were super happy with the tie being down 45-17. to 17. So, um, and then, you know, we beat Utah the next week and won the WAC and went to the Holiday Bowl yeah. again. So. I remember that, uh, that we're, it got archive audio from the KSL radio back in the day, Lavelle and the post game. He'd actually take calls, which is just insane. <laughs> I, think I, I know, that. Right? <laughs> that, that after that game, there was a fan that called in and said, why don't you go for the win? And I think it was paraphrasing. He said something to the effect that, well, we, we wanted the conference title. And, yeah. and that, 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 that was pretty special and how good – those BYU San Diego State games. I mean, really, those were the the games that really kind of started weeknight football that we know with now Thursdays on NFL and Friday nights. It all kind of began with BYU San Diego State. Yeah, they they had some talent. I mean, Marshall yeah. Falk and uh, you know Dan McGuire, the yeah. quarterbacks is six eight. I mean, Darnay Scott and and uh, Patrick Rowe were great receivers. Um, you know, you look back and there were some guys on their defense, even though it was always an offensive shootout, they had some defensive guys playing the NFL too. And and so we always knew they were talented and it was going to be a test and, and uh, kind of got up for those games. And they were usually late night and <laughs> um, late late getting home. You know, we the San Diego airport had a curfew and we barely, I think we they let us go a few times after the curfew, but uh, just because the ball was in the air and, and both teams were, were throwing it. Last couple of things for you, Ty. I uh, appreciate all, all this time here. It's, it's just awesome to look back. I could go on and on. Uh, how much of an impact did, did BYU football, your experience at BYU, just shape you as a person, uh, your life today, just yep. everything that moving forward after after your playing days at BYU? Well, there's a, a lot of great things that happened for me off the field, too, at BYU. We're joining the church, meeting my wife, getting married, and, and uh you know, a lot of things happen for you, I think, as a college age person, you know, where you're trying to figure out who you want to be and who you are. But, you know, football wise, it was the perfect place for me. I mean, it was small town, great fan base, uh, hunting and fishing, you know, right there, right yeah. at your fingertips um, where you could get away from it for a little bit. Um, and then just the perfect system and, and the perfect group of guys to be with. So, um, you know, for me, it, w it couldn't have been a better fit, um, personally and, and athletically. So, um, it, it definitely, you know, shapes who you are as you learn to be an adult on your own, you know, thousand miles from home. Um, you, you have to figure a lot out. And, and for me, BYU is a great opportunity to do that. Do you still look back on, on your time at, at BYU and your relationship with BYU in high regard? Oh, hundred percent. You know, I, I, you know, obviously the coaching didn't go as planned, um, but you know, that'll never tarnish, um, you know, my, my appreciation for what BYU offered me as a player and as a student and as a person. And so, um, always, you know, grateful for, for BYU and what it provided me and, and